and believe it or not, an ideal place to study cosmic microwave background radiation is, again, the Antarctic continent. I hope we have the South Pole again, loud and clear this time. Yes, there you are. Hello. Can you hear us now? And not with this delay of 30 seconds. <laughs> No. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Clem Pryke. I'm from the University of Chicago. <laughs> Thank you. And we're here at the South Pole. Yeah, so that's John Kovac, Clem Pryke, and Steve Pardin, who are going to tell us about Einstein's legacy in cosmology today and the experiments at the South Pole being run right now by the National Science Foundation to try to understand this mystery, this mystery of the expansion of the universe. How do you do that? <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Clem Prake. As you just said, I'm here with John Kovac and Steve Payton. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the cosmic microwave background telescopes that we have here at the South Pole. So first off, what is the cosmic microwave background? Well, we call it the CMB for short. It was discovered in the 1930s that in every direction we look, things are moving away from us. So are we the most unpopular place in the universe? Actually, it turns out that there's a much simpler explanation. Space itself is expanding, carrying the galaxies along like a tide. So if space is expanding, then it logically follows that in some time in the past, the universe was infinitely dense, and that was the beginning of the Big Bang idea. Nowadays, the universe is, pretty sparse, is a pretty sparse place with huge reaches of space in between the galaxies and plenty of space between the stars within a galaxy. Turning the clock back towards the Big Bang, the universe must have been denser and hotter. Pretty quickly, people realized that once it must have been a big fireball, a smooth superheated gas. In a superheated gas we have lots of light. It's not quite the same, but think of the gas inside a fluorescent tube light. Also, in a superheated gas, the atoms are ripped apart, releasing the electrons to form what we call a plasma. The electrons and light bounce off one another, constantly changing direction. Now let's run the clock forward. At some point, as the universe expands and cools, and the temperature drops to a few thousand degrees, the electrons and nuclei start to form up to form normal atoms. Suddenly, the rays of light are no longer bumping into electrons, and from this time onwards, they stream freely through the universe as it continues to expand and cool. Nowadays, we know that this transition occurred at about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Early on, people realized that we should be able to see this light from the fireball of the early universe today. It was finally detected in the early 1960s. We call it the cosmic microwave background because the blinding white rays of light have stretched by the expansion of space all the way down through the infrared and become microwaves, similar to those in a domestic microwave oven. The universe today, as I said, is far from smooth. Galaxies are huge concentrations of matter compared to the nearly empty space in between them. These lumps have grown by gravity from very small lumps in the early plasma. It was realized that we ought to be able to see these small variations, see these lumps as very small variations in the brightness of the cosmic microwave background. These ripples were first detected in the early 90s and have recently been measured very well by a NASA spacecraft called WMAP. Here is a WMAP map of the whole sky. Imagine that the Earth is at the center of the sphere. What we are seeing is light that set off 13 billion years ago from a spherical shell around the position where Earth would eventually form. So when we look at the CMB, we get a core sample of the structure of the infant universe. It turns out that the type of pattern we will see in the CMB ripples is determined by the nature of the universe, what it is made of, how fast it's expanding, etc. Not only that, but the type of pattern for a given universe can be accurately calculated from simple theory. That's a very wonderful thing. The present day universe is very complicated and hard to model. A large number of telescopes have measured the CMB, producing increasingly precise results. At the moment, CMB and other types of measurements all seem to indicate a bizarre thing that the present day universe is 70% dark energy, an intrinsic energy density of space itself. If that's right, far from slowing down, the expansion of the universe is currently accelerating. And in the future, it will literally blow itself apart, which is not a very comforting thought. Well, that should give you an idea of why we want to measure the CMB. Now, why on earth would we want to do it here from the South Pole? The answer is rather odd, considering we are sitting on three kilometers of ice the atmosphere above the South Pole is extraordinarily dry. All the water is frozen out. Water emits microwaves, preventing us from seeing through the atmosphere into space. There have been a whole series of CMB experiments at Pole. I'm going to show you pictures of a few recent and current ones, 
And then John and Steve will say a few words about new telescopes which are right now being installed. Here is a picture of DAISY, which was the first telescope to detect the polarization of the CMB. DAISY was a special kind of radio telescope called an interferometer. Last year, DAISY was refitted to become quad. Here's a picture of, of quad in its large bowl-shaped shield. This helps prevent the telescope from seeing the ground, which is very, very hot, even here at the South Pole, compared to the depths of space. This is a picture of Akbar on the Viper telescope, whose claim to fame is having made some of the highest resolution maps of the CMB to date. And now over to John Kovac, who will tell you about a brand new telescope being installed right now here at South Pole. Thanks, Clem. Here at the South Pole, there's only one day and one night each year. Each is six months long. Our telescopes take their best data during the long polar night. Between March and October, temperatures can plunge to minus 80 C, and a few brave souls will stay here to keep things running and to transmit data back via satellite every day. Minus 80, Jesus Christ, that must be cold. Are you still there? You're not frozen. <laughs> yes, we're still here. Great. Right now you're seeing a video of the BICEP telescope, which was just lifted into place yesterday. Okay. Most of the construction activity here at the South Pole has to happen now during the summer months when temperatures outside are a balmy minus 30 and planes can fly in and out. The new telescope is called BICEP. By now you'll get the impression that CMB telescopes usually have strange names. Best not to ask what the acronyms stand for. But BICEP, once it's working, will be renamed Robinson. BICEP is the first telescope built specifically to search for patterns of CMB polarization that would reveal inflation in our universe. That isn't the kind of inflation that eats up your paycheck. It's the name for our best current theory of how Einstein's general relativity and quantum mechanics might have combined dramatically in the first moments of creation and could answer some of our most puzzling questions about why, we, about why today's universe is the way it is. The pattern for inflation that BICEP is searching for in the CMB might look like this. Right now, we're working furiously to have BICEP ready by the end of the summer season. The last plane leaves February 15th, only 10 weeks away. And now Steve Payton will tell you about an enormous new telescope that will be BICEP's next door neighbor. Thanks, John. Our new telescope will be called SPT for South Pole Telescope. Up to now, radio telescopes at the South Pole have been a relatively modest two to three meters in diameter, but SPT will have a 10 meter reflector. Here's a picture. You can get an idea of the scale size from the small man standing at the base of the, the telescope model. Building a telescope of this size at the South Pole is a huge engineering challenge because everything must be designed to work in the extreme cold. We also have to fly all the parts in, so the SPT has to break down into small pieces that can fit inside an airplane. SPT is going to search for clusters of galaxies by looking for changes in the brightness of the microwave background caused by hot gas in those clusters. Our observations will tell us how galaxies grow in the universe, and from this we should be able to learn more about dark energy. Okay, we've told you a little bit about the cosmic microwave background and how we study it down here at South Pole. Now we'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, I have a question for first. You mentioned these uh, temperature differences in the cosmic microwave background, uh, these anisotropies. What do you think is the origin of those differences? Well, the, the origin of the differences is very small differences in the density, and therefore the temperature, in the primordial plasma around the time that the transition from uh, plasma to neutral gas occurs. Any, any, any question from you, Rolf? No, no questions for me. I could just say that um, people think um, that um, these little fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background may be connected with the very early phase of the universe, which was mentioned there, which was called inflation, and that basically what we are seeing there is a hugely expanded quantum fluctuation. One of these fluctuations I've been talking about. Before, mm, yes. They are at the very beginning of the universe, and they are sort of basically the cause of these little inhomogeneities. 
I have a question for you. What is special about uh, the atmosphere down under in Antarctica to make it an ideal place for placing telescopes to observe the, the cosmos? Well, as I mentioned, the uh, special feature that brings us here to the South Pole to study the CMB is the extremely low water content of the atmosphere above the South Pole. So basically the temperature is so low that all of the moisture is frozen out of the atmosphere. It's kind of an ironic thing considering the South Pole is sitting on a three kilometer layer of ice, but it's a, one of the driest places on Earth. It's a desert here. Okay, so it's very dry. Uh, how, long, how long have you been there this time? I know you stay in Antarctica for a couple of months at least. And tell us a little bit about the working conditions down there how your day, your endless day, looks like? Well, the, the summer season is about three and a half months long. That's the period of time during which planes can fly in and out. And the rest of the time, uh, it's called, you know, wintering over. If you're here when the last plane leaves, you're stuck here until the next plane comes eight months later. So during the, the period that, that we come down here, during the summer season, we typically come for, for periods uh, from one month up to the full season, three and a half months. And we live in a very nice new station that's just been constructed. And uh, the experimental site where we work is about a kilometer from here. So we have to walk out there every day and walk back to have lunch and again to have dinner. So there's a considerable amount of walking around on the snow. Uh, when we're inside, conditions are very comfortable, normal room temperatures. We have uh, very nice facilities here. Yeah, well, I can, we can show you what it's like outside right now. Yeah, that's there, that is the actual South Pole. That's the you can see, uh, South Pole. You can see the flag just below the notice board. <laughs> you can see the actual South Pole. So we're sitting on an ice, uh, on a glacier effectively, which is flowing at about 10 meters per year. So each year the position of the South Pole has to be resurveyed and the South Pole marker re restaked. Oh. The, our volunteer has just got cold, and he's coming in. <laughs> he's been standing there for a while. Oh, how, no, he's back again. <laughs> how cold is the Antarctic summer? <laughs> so during summer, uh, temperatures are typically negative 30 centigrade to negative 35 centigrade. Uh, during the winter time, the temperature plummets all the way down to negative 80 centigrade. 80. Jesus Christ. So, uh, it's a fascinating, <laughs> a fascinating experience anyway. I really envy you, and I hope one day I'll come to see you. <laughs> Do you have a sauna at the South Pole? You're very welcome. Do you have a sauna? There is, in fact, a sauna, yeah. Ah, and, but... and some people play a crazy game. What's the game, John? There's a ritual called the 300 Club, and it's based on the Fahrenheit temperature scale. The sauna just barely reaches 200 degrees. That's positive 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And during the summer, during the winter time, during the dead of winter, there'll be a few days when the temperature will be as low as minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit down here. And so the game is to, well, take off as much clothing as you dare and run out of the sauna, run around the South Pole and back inside. So you're it's having very a dramatic. lot of fun. And, well, I guess people who are here for the long winter need some excitement. Yeah, you're having a lot of fun, guys. <laughs> and a lot of work, too. Thank you very much for being with us. That was one of the highlights of our webcast. Two connections to the Antarctica. The second one was much better. Thank you to the National Science Foundation for making this possible.